Send it along with your repair bill, and Quick Trip will pay you back for any fuel-related repairs. <laughs> Plus the gasoline. It's that simple. Buy your gasoline from Quick Trip with complete confidence. It's unconditionally guaranteed. Hi, my name's Mike Spurl. I used to have cancer. A few years ago, I was on TV for Iowa Methodist Medical Center. They smiled when things went well. They shared tears with us when things didn't go well. This time, I'd like to say thanks to the people at Iowa Methodist and to remind everybody that I'm still here, better than ever. And so is the Cancer Center at Iowa Methodist. The new John Stoddard Cancer Center at Iowa Methodist. We're in this fight together. Partly cloudy with evening temperatures in the 30s. Good evening, I'm Hugh Downs. And I'm Barbara Walters, and this is 2020. From ABC News, around the world, and into your home, the stories that touch your life with Hugh Downs and Barbara Walters. This is 2020. Tonight, there was big trouble in this private paradise. He thought that uh, they wanted the land to the point of where they would kill him for this land. One man stood his ground against the government and lost. I just saw all these guns. These men had guns. They went in to arrest a crook. Unfortunately, a man died. We killed him? Yeah. Tonight, a Lynn Sure investigation. Why did Donald Scott die? Do you believe there was marijuana on that property? Yes, I do. But was that what the government really wanted? They used that as an excuse to take his property. How far will the government go to get what it wants? Bang, bang, bang. My husband fell down right in front of me. A killing in paradise. Is this any way to live? Rejected by your family, by your co-workers, even by friends? I've gotten threats to burn my house down. What crime have these people committed? I'm just a smoker. Smokers, they're pariahs in the office. Ostracized, uh, discriminated against. And there's no escape at home. God, Grandpa smokes. You know, we got to keep the kids out of the house. Tonight, smokers come out of hiding to tell Hugh Downs their side of the story. How it feels being one of a dying breed. Plus, we told you the story of this little girl. Her fate was in the hands of the courts. Whose child is she? The mother who gave birth and then gave her away? Or the people who've raised her from birth? Now, the stunning court decision. You cannot subside the pain of having your heart torn out. This is like a death. And a last, desperate response. We will file an appeal. The final stage of this tangled emotional battle. I want my baby back. Those stories tonight, April 2nd, 1993. After this brief message. The power of Bravo Boss. New 7 amps of raw power. Onboard attachments. Zaps dirt above or on the floor. Big power, low price. Bravo Boss by Eureka. And you thought lightning couldn't strike twice. Country fairs are the best. Yeah, especially the country crock. Well, there's more to this fair than country crock. I know, but it doesn't taste as good. Oh. Come spread country fresh taste with fewer calories and no cholesterol. Shed spread country crock. It is the taste of the country. It has all the elements of a Hollywood movie. An idyllic location, intriguing characters, a millionaire intent on guarding his privacy and his young wife. A classic plot, one man standing alone against those in power. And finally, a sudden and tragic ending. But this story is not from the movies. It's a real-life drama, a story that has exploded in the headlines out west. The untimely death of Donald Scott. Well, there are two very different versions of why it happened and how. And tonight you'll hear both. Do you believe the widow who for the first time recalls the painful scene that she witnessed? Or do you accept the word of the lawmen who took Donald Scott and his wife by surprise? Lynn Shore traced this frightening story from its beginnings to its shattering conclusion early one morning in Malibu. 911 emergency, what are you reporting? 
Yes, this is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Uh, we have a uh, we have a gunshot victim here. My husband was murdered um, right in front of me. My men went in to take some dope off the streets. They went in to arrest a crook. Unfortunately, a man died. They wanted his property, and they were going to use any means they could to get it. This is the story about a man and his land, and questions that have been raised about who wanted it and the lengths they might go to get it. Donald Scott was killed on this stunning California ranch in October. His widow and others charge that Scott was a victim of a law that was distorted and authority misused by those who were sworn to protect him. This was Donald Scott's private paradise, 200 acres in Malibu, California, amidst the Santa Monica Mountains. Estimated value, $5 million or more. He called the property the Trails End Ranch. At 62, thanks to a family inheritance, Donald Scott was a millionaire, a multimillionaire. In earlier years, he had the dashing good looks of a Hollywood leading man who enjoyed fast cars and guns. He dated debutantes and movie stars, and he drank too much. But friends like Tim Randa say he wasn't trying to impress anyone. It was fun. He knew how to have a good time. And he wasn't an eccentric. He was a regular guy, and that's all he ever wanted to be was one of the regular guys. And he was. Two years ago, Donald met Frances Plant. A native Texan, she was half his age. They used to joke he could adopt Frances rather than marry her. And the age difference didn't bother you? I never really thought about it. I always told him he was 61 going on 16, you know. He just had all this energy. And we uh, did a lot of uh, singing, uh, a few more beers than we should have had. We told jokes, we laughed, we, we were really happy. In his last months, Donald's eyes had begun to fail, and the liquor was taking a toll on his health. Some said he'd become reclusive. Francis said he just enjoyed being on the ranch. Charles and Ranch was his baby. He loved it. He, he took care of it. This is what Charles and Ranch is all about. Turn around. Oh, my God. This is it. Oh, it's fabulous. It seemed the perfect life. Quiet and simple if slightly eccentric and quirky. But before long, their private Garden of Eden would turn into Paradise Lost. Good morning, I'd like to welcome you all to Rancho Sierra Vista Sat Wewa on behalf of the National Park Service. At first, attention focused on Donald Scott's neighbors, the National Park Service. In the 30 years since he bought his ranch, the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area grew up around him, with the National Park Service buying up every bit of land possible. Some say that made Trails End a prime candidate for purchase. Tim Thomas was a park ranger here for 12 years. From what you know, did the National Park Service want Donald Scott's property? Uh, from congressionally intended land acquisitions through the land protection plan, yes. And from the resource values that were on there, yes. David Gackenbach is superintendent of the park. Is it fair to say that you wanted to acquire the Trails End Ranch? It's one of our fee acquisition parcels, yes. But it has not been a high priority uh, in this park. But Tim Thomas says the National Park Service always viewed the Scott property as crucial, and not only for its natural resources. Trails End Ranch sits right next to a popular campsite in the park, and it's bordered on two other sides by Park Service land. So this was a very important piece that was missing from the big jigsaw puzzle. It's right in the middle, right in the middle. Tim Miranda says the Park Service tried several times to talk with Scott about selling. The answer was always no, and Scott backed it with money. He told them at that time that he had a uh, million dollars in the bank waiting for them to come at him because they were never going to get it because he had the money to fight them, and they knew it. He had a feeling that, it was just a feeling that they were going to try to get the land from him somehow, um, he thought that uh, they wanted the land to the point of where they would kill him for this land. 
He said that? Yeah. Donald Scott may have foreseen his own violent death, but as it turns out, it was not at the hands of the National Park Service. Shoemaker. Two years ago, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department received an anonymous tip about Donald Scott's wife. Captain Larry Waldy runs the narcotics unit. Like what was the original tip exactly? Just the original tip that an individual, uh, Francis Plant, was um, uh, flashing uh, large amounts of money driving expenses car expensive cars. Let me just interrupt for a second. When you say flashing large amounts of money and driving expensive cars, is that unusual for the Malibu area? I really can't say not being from the Malibu area, you know, and I don't know what they spend out there. The information on Francis Plant's activities in Malibu was filed away for nearly a year. And it was a difficult year. L.A. County was in a fiscal crisis. With the upcoming budget a billion dollars short, the Sheriff's Department was being hit hard. So like other law enforcement agencies around the country, it relied more on the proceeds of drug investigations to supplement the budget. Finding drugs on Donald Scott's property would have enabled the Sheriff's Department to seize the ranch, sell it, and then take the profits. It's called asset forfeiture. And the laws allowing it, where drugs are involved, are controversial. In fact, it is now charged that asset forfeiture was exactly what the Sheriff's Department had in mind when they reopened the case a year after the original tip. We then uh, got a, a tip from a reliable informant that, in fact, that marijuana, large amounts of marijuana were growing there. Sheriff's Deputy Gary Spencer decided to confirm the tip with aerial reconnaissance. At his request, DEA agent Charles Stowell flew over the Scott property and said in this statement that he saw 50 marijuana plants growing in a grove of trees. Seeking further proof and eager to check out Donald and Francis themselves, the Sheriff's Department sent ground teams from the National Park Service and the U.S. Border Patrol to spy on the Scots. Even though their surveillance turned up no marijuana, the L.A. Sheriff's Department got a search warrant. Let's talk about the morning of October 2nd. Exactly how many people were involved? 27 people were at the scene. It sounds like a very big crowd for 50 marijuana plants. Uh, there were at least five different agencies. We had the National Park Service there because we worked with them in dealing with the marijuana eradication program. Uh, LAPD was there uh, and DEA was there. Coupled with that is the National Guard that we worked with also in the marijuana eradication program and they were there to assist in that effort and also to learn. So the entry team was first set in place and uh, to go to the house. Uh, they knocked on the door, uh, California demand. We were in bed asleep and the house started shaking and the dogs were going crazy and... I got up as fast as I could to get dressed and I was going to the door and I see this face looking at me. Uh, at that point, the door burst open, and I just saw all these guns. These men had guns, and I didn't know who they were or what they were doing, and I, I don't know. I just screamed, don't shoot me, don't kill me, and I was backing into my living room. <sighs> my husband heard me. He came running out of the back of the house into the living room. I heard him say, Francis, are you all right? He had his gun pointed above his head. He looked at me, and the next thing, someone yelled, put your gun down, put your gun down, put your gun down. Bang, bang, bang. My husband fell down. Right in front of me. Minutes later, a sheriff's deputy phoned the supervisor, Captain Waldy, to report what happened. In police parlance, a 927D, a dead body. The deputy was unaware a recording device was attached to the phone. Captain DeWitt here. Yeah. I'm on a uh, search warrant with the Hidden Hills crew on this marijuana eradication thing. Yes. And they just uh, looks like uh, 927D here. At the location? Yeah. Some they, body there? No, uh, we put them down. We killed them? Yeah. The rest of that morning, deputies searched the property. 
This is the Grove, just down from the house, where, according to the search warrant, approximately 50 marijuana plants were said to be growing, suspended from these large trees. That's apparently a new technique using ropes to hoist the plants so they can't be detected. But when officials got down here later that day, they didn't find what they'd expected. Was any marijuana found? No. Any trace of marijuana? No, but we found some lines suggesting the block and tackle method uh, on some of the trees in that general vicinity, yes. Where are those ropes and lines now? Um, I don't know. They're probably still on the land or taken into evidence, depending upon how the investigators looked at that. If they're so important, why not take them? And if they're not important, then why bring them up? Well, would I take the water tower? Would I take the trails? Would I take everything else that indicated that marijuana was growing? I wouldn't do that. It just sounds as if you're dangling it out there when, in fact, you haven't got any proof at all. The rope is dangling. I don't dangle. I take it as an element out there, that's all. Do you believe there was marijuana on that property? Yes, I do. Was there pot growing on this property? Never. Uh-huh. Never, ever. Why do you think the National Park Service and the sheriff's deputies came to your house that morning? Well, it wasn't to serve a search warrant. What really did happen that October morning? Was it motivated by the desire for land? By the demands of a depleted budget? Or was it a legitimate attempt to root out drugs? Donald Scott's death left a host of unanswered questions, but one California official has spent months investigating the case. When we come back, the explosive report on Donald Scott's death, it reveals deceit, incompetence, and possibly illegal behavior by lawmen. The conclusion of Lynn Scher's disturbing investigation, next. 2020, brought to you by AT&T, the right choice. There's never been a better day to come back to AT&T. Well, how come they won't take me back? <laughs> In fact, over 100,000 businesses have come back. Yeah, I'll make it 100,001. Come back to AT&T now and your business, large or small, can get 100 days free. Oh, my whole career is a small business. Come back to AT&T, the best in the business. Ah, oh, come on, will you? Even my wife took me back. I mean, not for long. <laughs> oh, she'll hear from me, too. If you're looking for distinction and value in a luxury automobile, the answer is the special edition Cadillac DeVille. Equipped with luxurious options such as Phaeton roof, gold ornamentation, and leather seating areas. At a savings of $1,490, plus a $2,000 bonus direct from Cadillac for a total of $3,490. The special edition Cadillac DeVille, changing the way you think about American automobiles. Crispy or crunchy? Crispy or crunchy? Well, what's going on? I don't know what's taste better. The Scram Checks or this Mini Gram. Gram Checks with Crispy Mini Grams. Mmm, sounds delicious. Introducing delicious new Graham Checks with Crispy Mini Grams. Now you can have the great crunch of Checks and the great taste of Grams in milk. Which tastes better, Gram Checks or Mini Grams? Crispy or crunchy? <laughs> crispy or crunchy? <laughs> Check out new Graham Checks. Presenting the first high-performance machine designed for your family with easy-to-open windows, full stereo sound, a complete CD system, a spark plug produces an electric spark, and messaging center. If you're calling about the car, press 2. All created to get your family where you want to go. The Tandy Sensation, not just IBM PC compatible, family compatible. Take your family for a test drive to neighborhood Radio Shack. They'll test their toughness as the Jeep superstars begin on ABC's Wide World of Sports, Saturday. Monday, Freedom. FBI Director William Sessions guests. I had accepted that. On FBI, undercover. Almost anyone could get to the point where they lose touch with reality. A special edition of FBI, The Untold Stories. Then when you've got a gun, you're never too young to die. We got to stop these boys killing one another. A very important American detective, Monday. So, Donald Scott is dead, shot down in his home by Los Angeles deputies. His friends and his widow believe he is the victim of a government conspiracy. The government denies it. Who is telling the truth? Well, just this week, investigators examining the case 
issued their report. The findings are explosive, as you are about to hear in the conclusion of Lynchur's report. Donald Scott did not have to die. He should not have died. He's an unfortunate victim in the war on drugs. Michael Bradbury is the district attorney for Ventura County. His investigators have been studying the Donald Scott case for nearly six months. Their findings reveal a poorly planned operation based on incomplete and false information. And their report concludes that the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department was motivated in part to seize and forfeit the ranch for the government. The process, known as asset forfeiture, allows the state to profit by confiscating the assets of known drug dealers. Bradbury says it was forfeiture that motivated one sheriff's deputy, Gary Spencer, to push a drug investigation too far and to mislead a judge into signing a search warrant. He provided misinformation to the magistrate and he left out uh, a lot of very material facts that would have indicated to the magistrate that in fact marijuana was not being cultivated there. According to D.A. Bradbury, the most significant facts left out of the search warrant involved drug enforcement agent Charles Stowell, enlisted to confirm the original tip about drugs. Remember, it was Stowell's claim that while flying at low altitude over the Scott property, he'd spotted 50 marijuana plants hanging from trees that had formed the basis for the search warrant. That's a claim upheld by Captain Larry Waldy, who runs the Sheriff's Narcotics Unit. You're convinced that the DEA investigator believed and told your folks that he saw 50 marijuana plants, no question about it. He was convinced, he was sure. The information that I have, he was absolutely convinced that he had seen 40 to 50 plants growing in a particular form on the ground, which was the hard evidence that we felt we needed to go seek that search warrant, yes. There is virtually no way that Stowell could have seen through that canopy of trees. Uh, it's like a, a rainforest, it's impenetrable. What would be the motivation for lying? I think Agent Stowell was under tremendous pressure from uh, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office in the person of Deputy Spencer uh, to come up with uh, the opinion that marijuana was being cultivated on the ranch. As a matter of fact, after uh, Stowell initially said that he had seen marijuana, he called Spencer back and, and said, I am not comfortable with you using my name and you have to corroborate uh, me. So you're saying that Agent Stowell did the flyover probably didn't see anything, but said that he had seen marijuana plants, and then the next day said, look, I'm really not comfortable with this? Correct. Bradbury added that contrary to normal practice, Stowell took no photos during his flyover. And he said, the ground surveillance ordered to corroborate Stowell and carried out by Border Patrol agents was against the law. Border Patrol normally used for marijuana searches? No, uh, their mission is, of course, to uh, search for and apprehend illegal aliens. Is that illegal for the Sheriff's Department to bring in the Border Patrol to do that? Yes, I think clearly it's a civil trespass. Neither Spencer nor Stowell would talk to 2020. But the DA's report found that Border Patrol agents were unable to confirm marijuana on the Scott property. So Deputy Spencer went back to the informant, who this time reported that 40 pounds of marijuana were about to be shipped out of the ranch. Spencer and Stowell figured that yield equates to about 50 plants. And Stowell said, okay, that is sufficient corroboration. So the same agent who said he saw marijuana and then changed his mind, hears this new information and says, okay, fine. Maybe I did see it. Is that basically what he said? What he said was, you may now use my name as having seen marijuana in the flyover which is exactly what Deputy Spencer of the Sheriff's Department did. He obtained a search warrant without ever mentioning Agent Stowell's uncertainty about his aerial observations. Deputy Spencer also neglected to include the failure of the Border Patrol to eyeball marijuana from the ground. According to the DA, these omissions are a clear violation of the law. When you keep that information out of a warrant, you deprive the judge of making an informed decision. Uh, and in fact, that can, and in this case did, in our opinion, invalidate the warrant. But the financial stakes were so high, Bradbury says, that deputies continued to push the investigation. Do you believe that the intent was to kill Donald Scott? No, not at all. Uh, I mean, there was certainly discussion among the deputies about forfeiting the land uh, if, in fact, drugs or marijuana was found. And there was even some joking, uh, and I, I think it was clearly joking by Spencer, to 
uh, National Park folks that, you know, maybe we'll give you the, this ranch property. Uh, but absolutely no intention of killing Scott. I think that this was an absolute shock to everybody involved that there was a shooting. Particularly, according to D.A. Bradbury, since the sheriff's deputies knew from surveillance reports that neither Donald nor Francis would be a threat. As for the shooting itself, the DA cannot confirm Francis's insistence that Donald Scott was simply trying to comply with orders to drop his gun when deputies shot him. You're saying your husband never pointed the gun at the officers? No, never. He never had a chance, no. He never had a chance to anything. Uh, it was just bang, bang, bang. Donald Scott came out uh, with a gun in hand and pointed his weapon at the deputy sheriff. They yelled several times, Don, don't shoot, put the gun down, put the gun down. He refused to do that, and, um, and unfortunately, they, uh, they were forced to fire, and uh, tragically, he was killed. If he was supposed to be putting the gun down, how can you say that he was aiming at them rather than simply complying with their order? They told me the man pointed a gun at them. I take that at face value, and I accept that, and they were forced to fire. Uh, from everything we can determine, we're convinced that Donald Scott was not about to have a shootout with sheriff's deputies. Uh, it's very likely that he was, in fact, trying to comply with the request to put the gun down. So why did they shoot him? Well, uh, as he lowered the gun, if it was pointed at them, they had every right to shoot him. At that point, uh, you, you can't... Uh, second-guess the officers when they have a loaded gun pointed at them. So you're saying the officers did what they had to do and the shooting, how would you then term the shooting? An, an accident? An unfortunate accident? What? No, it wasn't an accident. It was an intentional killing, but it was justifiable. Uh, but I think that begs the question. The crux of this issue is that those deputy sheriffs shouldn't have been there in the first place. Because, says Bradbury, there was absolutely no evidence of marijuana growing on the property. Remember those ropes and lines Captain Waldy insisted his men had seen? The ones indicating marijuana plants had been hoisted up in the trees? There's no evidence that there were ropes and lines there. There was one cable that appeared to be used to keep the tree from falling into some power lines, uh, and that was near the house. He told me there were ropes and lines there. Nothing. No. As for the Park Service, the agency Donald Scott feared most from the beginning, the DA's report concludes that their involvement in the drug operation was minor, that there is no evidence they played a significant role in the forfeiture plan. I know that there were some suggestions that they were part of a conspiracy to seize this ranch property. Uh, we found absolutely no evidence of, of, uh, of that and believe that that was not the mm -hmm. case. But what did the Park Service stand to gain from this operation had it been a success? I think that the Park Service recognized that if, in fact, that land went on the auction block, they'd have an opportunity to bid for it. Frances remains unconvinced. She says too much bad blood exists between private landowners in the park and the agency. In fact, land acquisition policies of the Park Service across the United States have been criticized for years as being heavy-handed and, in some cases, illegal. I will never be able to be convinced that they came here to serve a search warrant you know? No way. Evidence from the DA's investigation seems to support that concern. According to DA Bradbury, at a briefing before the raid, officers from the Sheriff's Department passed out these documents. A property appraisal of the 200-acre Scott Ranch and a map, including notations by Agent Stowell that a neighboring 80-acre site had recently sold for $800,000. The district attorney argues there is no reason why a search for drugs would require such information, other than if they had a motive to forfeit the Scott property. Was the primary motivating force in this case, as far as your investigation determined, get the property or get the drugs? Uh, our opinion is that they were uh, both goals of this operation. When a narcotics officer or a law enforcement officer is put in a position of, of, of being a revenue producer. Does that somehow corrupt the system? I think it does, personally, yes. Bradbury thinks that's exactly what happened at the Trails End Ranch. I think this is simply a case of uh, a good officer, uh, very aggressive, who lost his moral compass, uh, 
uh, saw an opportunity to uh, have his star rise rapidly in the department by seizing a significant asset. We have never sought any assets. We have never done any type of operation with the focal point of being assets. It's crooks, it's dope, and if you get an asset, it's a byproduct and nothing else. Today, Frances takes little pleasure from this land. The memories of her husband and his love for these hills have now dissolved into the painful reality of one morning in October. I'm not selling off into the sunset with Donald Scott, so I'm stuck here, and I'm going to stay here and keep the land just like Donald did all these years. You are determined, you told me earlier, not to sell this land at all now, not to anyone. This land is not for sale. God owns this land. There's no money that can buy this land. Lynn, this seizure law seems to have wide opportunity for abuse and nasty accident. Well, that's precisely what the DA told us. In fact, he said law enforcement agencies should be much more vigilant when they give out these search warrants so that this kind of thing won't happen. In fact, he said he blames his own department. They didn't ask enough questions, and in the future, he says they will. Now, what's happening now with the widow, Francis, and the land? Well, it's not clear that she can hold on to it, even though, of course, she desperately wants to. That's because Donald Scott had a previous wife, a former wife, and several children, and the inheritance situation is such that she won't get everything, and she may not be able to afford to hold on to it. Now, what about the officers who were incriminated in the DA's report? Well, Deputy Spencer is still on active duty. There has been no disciplinary action taken. Uh, the Sheriff's Department says they're just looking at the report right now. Uh, the DA, however, says that his findings will appear before at least one grand jury, and the DEA is also reviewing the report. Thank you, Lynn. Well, next, they call themselves the newest minority, and they don't like the way they're being treated one bit. We're talking about people who smoke. They believe non-smokers can be hazardous to their health. Now they're fighting back. Hughes report in a moment. If you want to get results like these, you got to know the tricks of the trade. You got to ask Sherwin-Williams. They got good paint, good price, good advice. I didn't paint this house. The do-it-yourselfer did. He knows what the pros know. Ask Sherwin-Williams. If your business gives up the quality of AT&T International Long Distance and calls Italy with someone else, here's your big savings. Leaving AT&T doesn't make a lot of sense. In the ongoing march against dirt, Bissell takes a giant step forward. Bissell proudly brings you one powerful cleaning system that deep cleans deep down carpet dirt, powerfully cleans your upholstery, and even replaces your vacuum for everyday cleaning and wet spills too. The Bissell Big Green Clean Machine. Once again, Bissell makes dirt history. You know, when I was younger, I always thought, my gosh, I can't even imagine being 30 years old. And then suddenly I was 30. And you get these little wrinkles and dry skin. And I had this revelation. I thought, you know, it's about time for me to start paying more attention to my face, my skin. Dove contains one quarter moisturizing cream. It won't dry your face like soap. After using Dove, my face doesn't feel as dry. It feels softer. I wish I'd started using Dove a long time ago. You know, because you just don't realize how quickly time passes. When Ford refined the full-size car, we made its shape more aerodynamic. Its V8 engine more powerful and yet more efficient. We also added to its comfort and even its safety with available anti-lock brakes and dual airbags. But through it all, one thing about the Ford Crown Victoria has remained the same. It's still as quiet as a Rolls Royce. Have you driven a Ford lately? They keep to themselves, loitering alone or in packs. People who need a fix, smokers. They're the butt of dirty looks and blame, the target of new laws. It's a drag, and they're not going to take it anymore. A dying breed fights back when 2020 continues. Saturday. Red Connors escaped from prison. The psychopath stalks the cop who put him away. He's a cop killer. Now, Tony's in a race against time. Let her go! To save an innocent family. I don't want to get into a chase situation here. The commission, Saturday. <laughs> 
In central Iowa, the weather is always changing. That's why Channel 5 makes the local forecast a top priority. We'll give you the weather forecast five times during the 5 o'clock report and six times during the 10 o'clock report. Whatever the weather, we'll give you simple, accurate information without the wait. More forecasts, more often, only on Channel 5 News. Hi, I'm Rod Fowler. There's a business in Eldora that definitely lets the chips fall where they may. Monday night at 10, I'll take you inside New Generation Plastics Incorporated and show you how five brothers are betting their success on poker chips. Live inside, Monday night at 10. Yonkers Chairman and CEO Tom Gould. Yonkers President sale is this Saturday only, and I've personally made sure it's a very exceptional sale. Save an additional 20% on most sale and regular priced merchandise. And as always, Yonkers offers free courtesy gift wrap, free shopping bags, and complete satisfaction. The President's Sale starts this Saturday at 8 a.m. Yonkers President's Sale is an exceptional sale, and you have my word on it. Iowans start a letter-writing campaign for little Jessica tonight at 10. Well, it's banned in the White House and just about every place else, it seems. And if the inconvenience of finding a place to do it is not enough to discourage smokers, there's also a proposal for higher taxes on cigarettes. Still, with all that going against smokers, the government issued a surprising report yesterday. For the first time in 25 years, the percentage of Americans who smoke leveled off instead of dropping. Tens of millions of people are still lighting up on a regular basis. And if you're one of them, this story is for you. Are smokers a dying breed, or are they just regrouping? They're mysteriously vanishing once they traveled the country openly and freely. You'd see them on airplanes, ride with them on trains, even mix with them at the office. But now they're being forced underground. There's evidence they're still among us, but they're increasingly afraid to show themselves in public. I've gotten nasty letters. I've gotten d threats. I've gotten threats to burn my house down. Uh, and I've gotten what some people would consider death threats. And it's all because I'm a smoker. Smokers have become outcasts, social pariahs. You might even call them a dying breed. And now there are new reports that suggest their second-hand smoke may be killing off the rest of us, too. As a result, smokers have come to consider themselves the most persecuted minority. They say that their rights are diminishing and that the attacks on them are increasing both in number and viciousness. There was a point in the anti-smoking campaign where it became an anti-smoker campaign where we all started to feel, you know, deliberately uh, ostracized, uh, discriminated against, uh, even some very hateful kinds of things. It's gotten so intense for smokers that several turned us down for interviews, fearing a backlash from employers or family. Others asked if we would not show their faces. Two-pack-a-day smoker Jane Doe felt more comfortable with a pseudonym and dark glasses. She's already under attack on both work and social fronts. I have been invited to parties where I've been told ahead of time that I'm welcome to smoke and the smoking section is outside, and this has been in the dead of winter. Pack-a-day smoker Art Laney feels if other groups were persecuted as openly as smokers, there'd be an uproar. I think you'd probably see demonstrations down in Washington that would scare the living Jesus out of you. Laney's day begins early with a long commute to work. Now added to the usual workday stress is a new string of frustrations. Before leaving New Haven, he used to enjoy a cigarette with his morning coffee, but smoking in the station is now a thing of the past. He and his friends used to board a car set aside for smokers. That's gone, too. You can't smoke on a train, so we usually stand in front of the train door if we want to get that one last cigarette in. They know once the train pulls out, it's a 90-minute journey, an eternity for addicted smokers. All along the route, you see the same thing. Smokers getting in one last drag, often alone and sometimes ashamed. It forces you into a defensive posture. You're more apt to cup it, okay, and try to socially hide it. If you're smoking a cigarette, 
You know, people will go like this in a stairwell, you know, they'll give you all that sort of stuff. They may say, oh my God, he's one of those, you know. Uh, that bothers me, it sticks in my craw a little bit. So does the fact that even once he reaches his Wall Street office, he still can't light up. My building is a total non-smoking building. Shut out once again, he and other smokers gather in front of the building. Even in winter, they come down in shirt sleeves, interrupting their work pattern for a quick fix in the cold. It's a sight ever more common. Nearly 60% of U.S. companies ban smoking in the workplace. At workday's end, Art's on the train back home. But even when he reaches the bosom of his family, there is no shelter from harassment. My son wasn't going to come to see me with his children because, you know, God, Grandpa smokes. You know, we got to keep the kids out of the house. Does that make him want to quit? No. It just makes him nostalgic for the days his grandparents smoked into their 80s and 90s. They all smoked, and they all smoked non-filter type cigarettes, and they all smoked two packs a day. Smokers like to recall happier days when cigarettes danced, when TV stars smoked them and sold them. But for filter and taste, Kent satisfies best. I'll accept that. <laughs> Days when everyone seemed to be smoking everywhere. Now, instead of coddling from sponsors, TV delivers to smokers bludgeoning blurbs from public health officials. The Cold War is over, yet one of the most threatening devices known to man is still being manufactured right here in America. California Department of Health ads hammer home the dangers of secondhand smoke. One ad says 14 Californians die each day from other people smoking. What effect do ads like these have on smokers like Martha Persky? Oh, it's been devastating. Absolutely devastating because how do you how do you answer someone who comes up to you and says you're killing babies? I don't know how to uh, how smokers can defend themselves when it comes to that. Already in retreat, smokers are most likely to come under attack along that invisible border which separates non-smoking from smoking sections in public places like restaurants. Non-smokers have developed strategies to heighten smokers' discomfort. There's the um, unrelenting light cough. <coughs> A lot of that. A lot of tisking. Um, the tisking, yes. Tisking and... Uh, Mostly, though, people really come out and say this is disgusting. Don't people have a right to be disgusting in their own sections? Anti-smokers say no. The non-smoking section, there ain't no such thing. Tobacco smoke drifts, it is recirculated. Would you allow asbestos particles to fall down in one room or in one half of a room and let people sit in another room or the other half of the room? The answer, obviously, is not. So Law professor John Banshaf runs ASH, Action on Smoking and Health. He predicts that by the year 2000, smoking will be outlawed in virtually all public places. We're not trying to force smokers not to smoke. We're simply saying, don't smoke around me. Powerful political allies agree. From the White House to the Big House, smokers are being banned and banished. Still, a half trillion cigarettes are consumed each year in America. And 25% of adult Americans still smoke. But a mushrooming number of state laws are limiting where they can do it. Even in tobacco industry strongholds like Kentucky, smoking is restricted in some state buildings. In Pennsylvania, there's a proposal to ban smoking in your own car if there's a child under 15 aboard. Some 50 American cities already ban smoking in any public building, restaurants and even outdoor stadiums included. A nightmare come true for smokers like Fred Phyllis. It's, it's, think of any place where smoking could be banned and there's somebody finding some way to propose it. It's getting so that the out of doors may soon become the only safe haven for smokers. But Jane says she's been admonished even there by both strangers and friends not afraid to be rude. Rudeness with a real nasty edge to it. The kind of things, when people do wag their index finger at you and in loud voices say, don't call me when you have lung cancer in X number of years. And this has happened to me many times, not just me. And I, that certainly puts a damper on the evening, don't you think?
wanted elsewhere, smokers are still welcomed with open arms in bars and nightclubs, their last stand against the smoke stoppers. Bar owners say smokers are the biggest spenders, drinkers, and tippers. That fits the smokers' image of themselves. Psychological studies give smokers a personality profile. They find smokers likely to be risk-taking, impulsive, defiant, extroverted, driven, and depressed. They've got one other trait, too, of course. They're addicted. We recognize the problem. But being addicted doesn't give you the right to inflict that risk on an innocent third party. Smokers say they don't want to hurt anyone. They're just looking for peaceful coexistence. But for the moment, they are angry and organizing. Fred Phyllis heads the Connecticut Smokers Association. They say legislative assaults on smoking raise serious personal rights issues. Where does it stop? Uh, I mean, logically, there's no end to it. Uh, it's an open-ended transaction once you start to limit personal behavior to meet someone else's ideal. You might wonder if it's so tough for smokers these days, why don't they try to quit? Surveys say three out of four smokers want to, but you can't prove it in this room. If I wanted to quit, I would, but I'm a smoker. I'm 56 years old, I've smoked all my adult life. I'm just a smoker. How about the other smokers we talked to? So Jane says the social pressure is getting to her. She'll quit in a year or so. Art Laney says if cigarette taxes go much higher, he'll kick the habit. If they do stop, there will likely be two more voices in the anti-smoking chorus. Two more wet blankets on any happy smoking crowd. As any smoker is fond of telling you, when it comes to abusive intolerance for the habit, there's nothing worse than an ex-smoker. <laughs> I should point out I'm an ex-smoker. It's been 35 years since my last cigarette. But I believe smokers have rights that I won't, don't like to see impinged on. As long as they don't... Uh, invade other people's environment and health. What rights? They have a right to ingest whatever chemical uh, into their body uh, they want to. And, and provided they're doing it walking or... And I'd hate to see it drift toward, uh, toward making it illegal or something. That would be to only create crime and high taxes would create a, uh, a black market. I it's interesting, like that. that report that came out that for the first time in 25 years, smoking is not on the, on the decrease it's and it seems to be off. people of lower income uh, uh, levels, it says. Okay. Who are smoking? I think it's a function of poverty, uh, at least in part, because uh, that's, a, that's an escape to, to start with a drug, and, and uh, nicotine's a drug. Anyway. Well, next we're going to talk about the little girl that almost everyone is talking about. This week, the courts have finally decided her fate. The dramatic follow-up to our heartbreaking story, I Want My Baby Back, right after this. at the Pons Institute. The discovery of Nourishing Complex 7. The miracle behind Pons' new Nourishing Moisturizer Lotion. A moisturizer so advanced, it adds more effective moisture than the leading moisturizer. It reduces the appearance of fine lines by 20%. And it is oil-free. Pons' new Nourishing Moisturizer. For more information, call the Institute at 1-800-34-PONS. It's Toyota's Simply Irresistible sales event. Your Toyota dealer invites you to check out Camry. Simply Irresistible. Camry, one of the ten best cars you can own. Camry, the best car built in the U.S. Simply Irresistible. The incredibly quiet, comfortable, powerful Camry. It's Toyota quality at its best. Simply Irresistible. So hurry and see your Toyota dealer now, because Toyota deals are just... Simply Irresistible. Ragu introduces Beef Tonight, and people can't wait to get home for dinner. Beef Tonight, three new simmer sauces that turn your ground beef into hearty meals, like barbecue beef and beef stroganoff. I feel like beef tonight. Tension headaches this bad need a pain reliever this good. New Extra Strength Darnitol with Isa Migraine. Still going. Nothing outlasts the Energizer battery. It keeps going and going. It has a powerful overhead valve engine. Smooth five-speed transmission. Has the best resale value of any make. And comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. The cost? Just $1,999. It's the John Deere 12.5 horsepower STX 38 lawn tractor. 
at just $19.99. It's our lowest price ever. Monday. Imagine if to keep your job you had to give up your ability to have children. You're scum! This is my God-given right, and I am not about to let anybody take it away. It happened to these women. They have picked us off one by one. If you're going to continue working with the man, you ought to be putting out the welcome mail. Inspired by actual events. I want to sue McCade Industries. They rule this town. Elizabeth Perkins, Laura San Giacomo, a world television premiere for their own good. Monday. Tuesday, an hour of two funny ladies. First, an all-new Roseanne. I mean, before I die, I would like to see one of my kids go out that door in a prom dress. And if it's not you, DJ's gonna be real unhappy. The only way I'm going to the prom is if I can sit in the rafters with a bucket of pig's blood. Darlene and David go to the prom, but when they go too far, then Delta's back with a brand new look. Wow! And brand new attitude. She's Delta the way you love her. Do you like some sugar in there? Delta returns following Roseanne, Tuesday. There has been a very dramatic development in a story Tom Gerald brought to you recently, a story that has drawn an incredible amount of attention. At the center of it, a two-year-old child whose fate has been uncertain almost since the day she was born. For all but three weeks of her life, she's been caught in a tug of war between her biological parents and the couple that consider her their own. Can a mother sign away her child and then change her mind? As Tom Jowell reports, just this week, the legal battle over this very difficult question reached a stunning crossroads. An agonizing and lengthy custody fight between the two couples who want this little girl, known as Jessica, is nearly at an end. This week, the only parents Jessica has ever known, Robbie and Jan DeBoer, received the news they feared more than anything else. This is like a death. They must give up the child they've raised almost from birth. You cannot subside the pain of having your heart torn out and knowing that your daughter may go away very soon. She's getting wound The Michigan Court of Appeals ordered the couple to turn the two-year-old over to her biological father and all but extinguished any hope that the Ann Arbor couple can keep the child they had hoped to adopt. Jessica was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to an unwed mother who kept her pregnancy a secret and hastily put the baby up for adoption. It was several weeks after the baby's birth that Dan Schmidt learned from Kara Schmidt, whom he later married, that he was the father. The Schmidts decided to fight for Jessica, but Kara, who claimed she acted under duress, had terminated her parental rights. Dan, on the other hand, never signed away his rights and took legal steps immediately to get the child back. In the meantime, Jessica was taken to Ann Arbor by the DeBoers, who adored her and proudly introduced her to visitors as their baby girl. The Schmitz, of course, strongly disagreed. I'm her father, and uh, she belongs here. We're her roots. Her roots are here. The legal wrangling dragged on for months and months through the Iowa courts, which focused on the issue of parental rights. The DeBoers argued it would cause Jessica irreparable emotional damage to take her away from them. This child is 100% ours to that child's mind. That's the important issue here. Her mind. What's going to happen to it when you take her only parents away? As we reported earlier, the Iowa court sided with the Schmitz, and last September the Iowa Supreme Court ordered the child be returned to Dan Schmidt. The court found he was the father and the adoption process which had excluded him was flawed. Having exhausted all appeals in the Iowa courts, the DeBoers turned to their home state of Michigan to try to persuade the courts there to hear the case based on the best interest of the child. They won the first round. And the court is of the opinion that under Michigan law, it does have jurisdiction over the interest of this, best interest of, the, of this child. The victory was brief. The Michigan Court of Appeals overturned the lower court ruling, saying the case should have remained with the Iowa courts all along. The DeBoers say they will appeal the case to the Michigan Supreme Court, which has been flooded with calls from all over the country supporting the DeBoers. But even the DeBoers believe the chances the court will even hear the case is small. The baby may be in the hands of the Schmitz by the end of the month. 
Uh, so, Tom, the case is closed, isn't it? For all practical purposes, yes. Now, it was the biology, obviously, that Absolutely. went out. Absolutely. That was the final decision factor. The uh, court, lower courts in Michigan ruled that the best interest of the child would be to stay with the divorce. The, the higher courts took the law, as it always has, and lean toward the biological parents. And forget best interest of the right. child. Well, a public attitude toward this apparently has no bearing. Public attitude is supporting in a large way the divorce. Uh, yes. I mean, the Supreme Court of the state of Michigan is being inundated with protest letters, with uh, phone calls. But again, the court has to be heartless in this case and cannot consider any of that in their final appeal. Now, the biological parents, the Schmitz, are about to have uh, another child. Yes, around, they right? are. And, and yet this baby will be going back to them. Right. Um, Both sides are studying the transition now yeah. and how to handle that best. The uh, Schmitz have proposed that the transition period include visitation during the next three weeks so they can get to know the child in the DeBoer's home. Mm -hmm. The DeBoer's will have none of that. They plan to keep the child as long as they possibly can up until the last moment. How is Mrs. DeBoer? Mrs. DeBoer, uh, of course, is extremely upset by it. Her attorney says that uh, they will not bar the door when they come for the child, but she will not give up the child one second before she has to. Real pain. pain. Mm. Thank you, Tom. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm one full-sized adult. So naturally, I'm big on nutrition. But there's something inside of me that still gets really pumped about frosting. But who's kidding who? This body's a shrine. And we don't put fat or salt in the shrine. I'm lighting up. Relax. With Kellogg's Frosted Mini Wheats, you can have it all. For the adult in you, whole grain nutrition, fat-free and no salt. For the kid in you, lightly frosted, great taste. Hey, I'm no dumbbell. I know what I like. The frosting. Now at Goodyear, you can save 50% on the second tire when you buy one tire at the regular price. That's half off Goodyear premium all-season radials for cars and light trucks. Any way you look at it, you save. Only at Goodyear now. If you give up AT&T quality and call from Phoenix to Dallas with someone else, here's your big savings. Leaving AT&T doesn't make a lot of sense. They called her Blackbird. She flew higher and faster than any plane has ever flown. But there's a world where that's not good enough anymore. Where the boundaries are forever being stretched. So if you want a career in tomorrow's higher technology, go where the sky's no longer the limit. Aim high. Air Force. Sunday at 7, 6 Central. This landmark film is storytelling at its best. Let my people go. Charlton Heston stars in a classic film with classic actors. Oh, Moses, Moses. The ultimate in spectacle is a holiday tradition, the Ten Commandments, Sunday. Okay, at this moment we go to Washington where Ted Koppel is preparing tonight's Nightline. Ted? Hugh, tonight on Nightline, on the eve of this weekend's Clinton-Yeltsin summit, Russian President Boris Yeltsin has left a deeply troubled country behind. My guest, one of the most astute students of Russian politics, world chess champion Gary Kasparov. Hugh? That's Nightline after your local news. Well, next week on 2020, we have something, I think I can call it really special, because you remember, it's a follow-up on our story about the Irish conjoined twins, the two little girls who touched so many of you. As you may recall, only Eilish survived the surgery that separated her from her sister. And so you might, I'm sure you wonder how Eilish is doing now, and next week we're going to have a report on that. So we, uh, that's it for tonight, though. That's it for 2020. We thank you for being with us. Remember, we're in touch, so you be in touch. I'm Barbara Walters. And I'm Hugh Downs. For all of you, have a good weekend. Good night. For a transcript of 2020, send $7 to 2020 Transcripts, 1535 Grand Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203, or call 303-831-9000. For availability of a video cassette version of a 2020 segment, call the same number. 2020 is a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. This is ABC.
Coming up next from Channel 5 News. Areas of central Iowa underwater tonight after a week of flooding. You can tell the Michigan Supreme Court your opinion of the DeBoer custody decision. We'll have the address for you. The beat goes on here at Adventureland at the Palace Theater. The 19th Annual Variety Club Telethon about to kick off. I'm Paulette Longo. I'll tell you about it. All that plus sports and weather. The 10 o'clock report coming up next. Please stay tuned. Adults finally have a juice drink all their own. No more sticky, sweet kid stuff. Refreshers are different. The taste is crisp, light, never too sweet. This is different. In three flavors adults love. Mm, not too sweet. At last. Go for it, you grown-ups. Try new Ocean Spray Refreshers juice drinks. Not too sweet taste for adults. Can you hear me? Hear me? Hear me? There's been a terrible accident, and suddenly a life hangs in the balance. The doctor.